cryogenic adaptation uh, experiments. Um, he's well known for many things, uh, including uh, you know many novel approaches uh, in the field of cavity uh, or the general quantum optics. Physics of uh, things moving and coupled to light, um, including uh, the first membrane in the middle of the experiments, um, and he'll talk about uh, some some new new experiments. He's received many honors and awards. I'll just tell you the highlights, uh, a few of them, because uh, we can take all day. Um, the Vannevar Bush Faculty Fellow. He's one, recently won. Uh, he's an APS fellow, and um, he is one of the DARPA Young Faculty. So thank you very much for coming. Yeah. It's nice to see you in person. <laughs> yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you for the invitation, um, Ben, and thank you to all of you for coming. Uh, I know it's it's tight, but uh, anyway, uh, that was a joke about the size of the room. Anyway, I'm glad everybody has lots of room. That's good. Uh, so I guess you can hear me because I can hear me. Hey, Dave. Um, and uh, if you're the Zoom, if you're on Zoom, can you hear me? Yeah, looks good. Okay, is there a way? What am I missing? Like, how could I get rid of this? Yeah, it's already minimized, and I'm screen sharing. Yeah, I feel like should that. Oh my gosh. Hmm. Yeah. That was... <laughs> you know, I feel like I've done a lot of Zoom meetings and somehow I have not encountered quite this. Okay. All right. Well, hopefully, this little box won't be a major problem. I'll put it up here. Oh, look at that. That's amazing. That's so satisfying. Okay. Uh, so thank you for uh, coming. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, as Ben said, uh, my name is Jack Harris. I work in the physics department at Yale University. The work that I'm going to be telling you about is a really close collaboration between my group, which is an experimentalist uh, group, and the group of Nick Reed. Uh, Nick is my theory colleague at Yale University. And in particular, I really want to call out on the experimental side, uh, the outsized contribution of uh, postdoc Yogesh Patil, and on the theory side, the outsized contribution of uh, former graduate student Judith Holler. Um, so what I'm going to be telling you about today falls under the broad area that's sometimes known as non-Hermitian physics or complex wave dynamics. And this is a, a field that's grown up um, in the last decade or two, trying to understand some of the curious features of rather humble class of physical systems, linear wave systems, harmonic oscillators, um, but curious features that appear when one examines closely the well-known fact that all these systems contain a certain amount of dissipation, maybe they contain some non-reciprocal elements, the like, and the resulting dynamics uh, has produced a number of surprises. I'm going to try to tell you the story of some of those surprises and a very nice, clear, elegant explanation to them that was really explained to me by my uh, theory colleague, Nick Reed, uh, whose uh, judgment and wisdom I will try not to grossly misrepresent, but there's no guarantee. So the physical system that I'm going to tell you about, there are a lot of different ways of realizing it. But at the end of the day, what I'm going to be telling you about is just a collection of classical harmonic oscillators, and not very many, two, three, four. No, uh, it could be as many as you want, really. And I'm going to start by just uh, explaining to you kind of what's the distinction we make between calling some of these systems Hermitian and some of them non-Hermitian, what's the important difference. Um, I'm also going to be, try to be clear about whether I'm talking about quantum mechanics or classical mechanics, because sometimes in this field that isn't always made super clear. I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to be telling you about classical mechanics today, though there are interesting lessons to be drawn for both uh, domains. 
And specifically, the specific sort of curious phenomenon that I'm going to tell you about is the appearance of topology in the eigenvalue spectrum, in the normal mode spectrum of this object. So if you take away nothing uh, from my talk except for one thing, here it is on this slide, which is that quite generically, not in any sort of exotic uh, parameter regime or under the circumstances of interesting nonlinearities or extra this or that, quite generically, a system of three coupled oscillators as represented by here has within its normal mode spectrum, not structures, and uh, topological braid structures. And in fact, the most general and elegant way, natural way of understanding the spectra of such systems is in terms of uh, the braid group. And really uh, what we're gonna be talking about as a result is not about any particular physical realization. This is not an AMO talk. This is not a condensed matter talk. This is not an astrophysics talk. At the end of the day, I'm just gonna be telling you about a piece of mathematical physics or a piece of math that physicists often make use of, um, which is the following question. How do the eigenvalues of a matrix depend upon that matrix? If I was to try to plot them, let's say, as a function of matrix, what would that plot look like? Um, and I'll explain to you why the most uh, general uh, answer involves braids and knots. And in the end of my talk, uh, just for fun, we'll do an experimental realization of this. But really, the, the meat of the story is in the sort of mathematical physics question. OK, uh, so to begin with. Let me just make sure that this is plugged in. Well, so to begin with, uh, oh. okay. There we go. So uh, everything that I'm going to be telling you about today is about the solutions to this equation here. And maybe not even the solutions, but just some of the properties of this equation. And for the time being, let me not give this equation any physical interpretation whatsoever. It's just a mathematical statement. It says that there's an n-dimensional vector of complex numbers whose time evolution is generated by a matrix. Okay, so this is what we just call a linear dynamical system maybe. And H is some n by n complex matrix. And maybe we'll want to think about it depending on time, or maybe we'll want to imagine it depending on some control parameters. But for now, let's not worry about it. It's just this equation here. And um, all that I want to start out by saying uh, about this equation is that its qualitative features depend to some extent upon the structure of this matrix. Is the matrix uh, have some particular kind of symmetry? The other thing that I should mention is that this is an equation with some very familiar and very popular applications. You could regard this as the Schrodinger equation for a closed n-level quantum system, in which case this would be your state vector and the Hamiltonian operator of quantum mechanics. But you could also take F equals ma, written for a collection of harmonic oscillators, and bring it to this form, in which case that vector would just be a list of the position coordinates and momentum coordinates of those oscillators. And this matrix would be known as the dynamical matrix. Um, this could be the Lindblad uh, equation of motion for an open quantum system, or it could be the population dynamics of a herd of goats that is eating a herd of butterflies and there uh, some of them. Anyway, and there's some dynamics. So long as that dynamics was linear, we would write down this equation of motion here. So uh, let me just, uh, in terms of talking about the structure, the form of uh, the matrix that appears in here, if what you're doing is using this equation to represent a closed quantum mechanical system, then there are very good reasons for taking that matrix to be Hermitian. Okay. There are some people who are interested in what happens if you don't, but that's not the topic of today's talk. In standard quantum mechanics, H is taken to be Hermitian more or less as a postulate. And in that case, there are a number of uh, results that. Uh, are direct consequences of that hermeticity. For example, this matrix, all of its eigenvectors are going to be orthogonal, all of its eigenvalues are going to be real. And if I vary the matrix uh, via some control parameters, the eigenvalues are gonna vary in some smooth fashion. Um, these are just sort of mathematical facts. And in the course of studying this equation in quantum mechanics, at some point, we learn a bunch of results that we learn in quantum mechanics classes, but they aren't especially associated with quantum mechanics as a physical theory. They're just mathematical consequences of this equation. So for example, the adiabatic theorem. If I start with this state vector prepared in an eigenvector of this matrix, and then slowly change that matrix, 
the corresponding time evolution of the state vector will be the same as the parametric evolution of the corresponding eigenvector of this matrix. And if I keep track of the phase accumulated by this uh, state vector while I do that operation in a closed loop, I get this interesting thing called the Berry phase. And we learn about Landau's inner tunneling and Fermi's golden rule and the like, all of which are just mathematical properties of this kind of equation. Um, and just to be clear, uh, this, the particular physical system that I would be imagining here would be some n-level quantum mechanical system. And the interpretation of everything quantity that I've written is given here. An eigenvector of this matrix is an energy level, so on and so forth. All of these statements also apply without any particular thought to a system of n classical oscillators, system of n masses connected by some spring network here. Uh, in such a uh, system, I would write down F equals MA. I could convert it to this form. I would find that the eigenvectors of this uh, matrix would be orthogonal, um, eigenvalues real, so on and so forth. And all of these results would apply absolutely equally to the corresponding classical system. Um, so if I was to take such a system and excite it in one of its normal modes, it would stay in that normal mode. If I was to start varying the dynamical matrix that encoded all these spring constants and the like, very slowly, the system would remain in whatever instantaneous normal mode was smoothly connected to the one that was originally excited. Um, and so uh, basically, there's a formal isomorphism between these two systems in the sense that any statement that I make about these quantities that is true when I interpret those uh, statements in terms of this translation table that's true about an n-level quantum system is also true about a system of n harmonic oscillators when I assign this meaning to those mathematical objects. And this is a sort of wonderful opportunity to gain some intuition using tangible things for some of the phenomena that we think of as quantum mechanical. And occasionally people stumble upon this isomorphism and get very excited about it. Um, and it's not at all what I'm going to be telling you about today. Nothing to do with this. Instead, what I'm gonna tell you is sort of an extension of case 2.1, where indeed I am talking about classical mechanical objects, um, but where I say, look, Newtonian mechanics, Maxwellian electromagnetism, they both provide perfectly natural descriptions uh, of linear elements that are lossless and reciprocal, like masses and springs, or if you prefer, circuits, uh, inductors and capacitors but they also provide perfectly reasonable descriptions of linear uh, elements like uh, resistors or dash pots that break the time, that break time reversal symmetry. Um, and if you add to those the slightly less familiar element of the gyrator uh, from electrical engineering, or what would amount to a Coriolis force or a Lorentz force in a system of mechanical oscillators, then you can combine these elements together to realize any complex matrix for the dynamical matrix H. Okay. So it would be a little bit unwieldy to really imagine, you know, uh, bolting in dash pots and springs and Coriolis forces, putting everything on turntables and the like. And in practice in our experiments, that's not what we will do. But if you want like a tangible picture, if you were to construct such an apparatus, you would realize a system governed by this equation in which it was perfectly natural for this dynamical matrix to be any matrix over the complex numbers no particular symmetry. And uh, this is a fact that has many practical applications in uh, circuit design and sensors and electronic domain in uh, optical systems. I'm not gonna be talking about uh, practical applications. Um, instead, I'm gonna be talking about some of the generic features of what happens when you open uh, your mind to the idea that we would have linear evolution generated by an arbitrary complex matrix. So there are some things that don't change when uh, we take this point of view. For example, when you find the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this matrix, those are still really useful. They still provide a kind of scaffolding to talk about the time evolution of the system. Um, for example, any solutions uh, are still linear superpositions of the eigenvectors or the generalized eigenvectors. You need to be, take a little bit of care at the degeneracies, but that's also true when we talk about Hermitian evolution. There are, though, some qualitatively new features when we talk about evolution that's uh, generated by non-Hermitian uh, matrices. One is that the eigenvectors are not, in general, orthogonal, though they still form a complete basis. The eigenvalues are not real, but rather complex. And the thing that I'm going to be talking about mostly today is that if I take the dynamical matrix and just change it, um, 
you will find that the eigenvalues vary in a way that is topologically non-trivial. And I'll show you lots of pictures of this. So every time I say things like topologically non-trivial, I'm gonna show you a picture of some curly, exciting looking object. And uh, I should also say, I'm happy to just be interrupted and to take questions if you like clarifications at any point. Okay, so this is really what I'm gonna talk about. As you vary, uh, this, uh, as you vary a, a, a matrix, eigenvalues seem to trace out topologically interesting curves. So this particularly uh, was very well studied in the case where you just have two modes, two uh, oscillators coupled by some arbitrary complex uh, matrix, which you could real imagine realizing with these familiar linear objects. And it was found that as long as you had sort of two reasonable experimental controls, like knobs on one spring constant and another or something like that, um, then if you were to vary those two parameters, here are the two knobs, and you were to ask uh, as a function uh, of these control parameters, what do the eigenvalues do? And you were to plot out their imaginary part and the real part, because they're complex, so I have to show you both. Um, then uh, rather generically, at least in the neighborhood of a degeneracy, you'll find that the eigenvalues are pretty much always given by the square root function, where uh, I'm taking the square root of uh, complex number Z that I form from these two real valued control parameters. In the lab, most of our knobs are real numbers, but sometimes it is helpful to imagine turning two of them into a complex number uh, via this way. And because in general, in the neighborhood of a degeneracy, the eigenvalues uh, depend on perturbations away from the degenerate point as the square root of this control parameter, the sort of interesting topology that people were seeing uh, is just that of the Riemann sheets of the square root function. And to explain to you what I mean is, suppose that you started at this point, you set your control knob such that your system is governed by this equation of motion, and you measure what the eigenvalues are. You'd find the real part up here on this sheet and the imaginary part on that sheet. And then I just ask what those eigenvalues do as I imagine varying my control parameters uh, around that loop. And you just project the loop up onto these two sheets, and here's what happens. This is not interesting, by the way. This is you go around a circle and the eigenvalues return to themselves. But if you imagine executing a circle in this control space that happens to enclose the degeneracy, then even though you turn your knobs back to their original setting, the uh, eigenvalues, at least one of the eigenvalues that we're plotting here, uh, evolves in such a way that it doesn't come back to its initial value. It wraps around the branch point of the square root function. And so uh, the output of that function isn't the same uh, when you vary the input in a closed loop around a, a branch point. This is something we definitely encounter uh, the first time, uh, maybe in a first complex analysis class. And this is really, I would say, the end of the story for two modes. There's not much more to say about it than this. But uh, in the field of people who think about these things, there was not really a clear picture for what's the equivalent story when you have more than two modes. Like if I have four modes, should I hunt around in my control parameter space for a four level degeneracy and encircle that? Or do I have to like go around four double degeneracies and how many control knobs do I need to access kind of all this relevant, uh, interesting stuff? And should I really be thinking about this whole story in terms of permuting eigenvalues going from the lower sheet to the upper sheet or is there a more uh, important picture? And it turns out that all of these questions have pretty straightforward answers but they are just not possible to visualize in this fashion. And so a big part of what I talk uh, of this talk will be to describe a way of visualizing uh, this kind of general answer, but for an arbitrary number of coupled modes. Okay, so uh, one way of uh, framing the question here is just this. What is the set of eigenvalues or uh, what is the spectrum of eigenvalues viewed as a function of the matrix that governs them, that determines them. And if that's too complicated a mathematical object to picture, are there at least some generic features of the topological structure that I could talk about? So the first uh, answer is like, it is hopeless. Um, if we're talking about an n by n matrix, it's going to give you n complex numbers. And the matrix itself is determined by n squared complex numbers. And that's not something I can ever hope to plot for you. Like a four by four matrix, I'm supposed to plot uh, four complex numbers as a function of 16. I don't know how to, how to draw that. But there are a couple uh, steps that we can take that make things uh, much easier. 
And the first is to note that the eigenvalue spectrum doesn't really depend on all n squared of the matrix elements, at least not independently. So if you think what you do when you calculate an eigenvalue spectrum, you find the roots of the matrix's characteristic polynomial. And there's a crank that I, I memorized as an undergraduate for taking all these matrix elements and grinding out what the characteristic polynomial is. But the point is that an nth order polynomial will only is completely specified by its n coefficients. You give me a new set of coefficients, we're talking about a new polynomial. So the uh, eigenvalue spectrum, the roots of this polynomial, only depend on n complex numbers, the n coefficients of this polynomial, not all n squared elements uh, of, the, of the matrix. Okay, so that's a little bit better. Um, and it also provides us with an answer to the question of what is the, when we control uh, uh, a system by tuning its matrix elements, say, um, what are the relevant knobs in terms of controlling that system's eigenvalue spectrum? And the answer is just these uh, coefficients of the characteristic polynomial. So that's the natural control space for eigenvalue spectrum. There are a couple of extra little simplifications we can make, which is that generically with an eigenvalue spectrum, we don't care about the overall trace. And conveniently, one of these polynomial coefficients is just the trace. So we're kind of okay to always set this one to zero, throw away this coefficient. And then just as a matter of experimental practicality, we don't usually have complex valued knobs in the lab. So let me take this two n minus one uh, complex control parameters, the only remaining coefficients of the characteristic polynomial, and just regard that as twice as many real control knobs. So for a four mode system, I would need six uh, real numbers to specify all the coefficients in this polynomial. So I could regard that as a six dimensional control space. And that gives me full control over the spectrum of the system. So that's a picture of the control space. And the idea being that every point in this space specifies a characteristic polynomial and hence an eigenvalue spectrum. But how am I gonna actually plot like what the eigenvalue spectrum does as I wander around in this space? And again, I still can't do it uh, in full generality, but I think I can draw you a picture of the natural topological structures that emerge from this. And the way to do that is to do one more bit of drawing. So here's my control parameter space. This ends up being all the coefficients of my characteristic polynomial. A point in the space specifies a characteristic polynomial. And let me draw the output of that, the roots of the polynomial, as n numbers in the complex plane. So again, here I'm imagining a four mode system. There should be six dimensions. I can't draw that. So here's just a point. And here are those four uh, complex eigenvalues just drawn in the complex plane. Here they are that correspond to this polynomial. Any questions about this or any points I could clarify? This is a drawing that I'll be using a lot. So every point in this space corresponds to n points in the complex plane. And now let me do the following. Let me ask what happens when I take this uh, point that I started with and that gave me this nice spectrum and just ask what happens as I consider points around the perimeter of some closed loop. If I do that, I can tell you a few things right away without thinking too much. One of them, uh, do we have the animation? Yep, okay. So as I move the point I'm considering around this loop, um, one thing I know is that at the end of this loop, I'm back at exactly the same polynomial. So I have to have exactly the same roots. But if I ask what happens in between, well, this is a very small loop. And so probably none of these eigenvalues are gonna change very much. I'm not going to very different polynomials. And there's a nice theorem that tells you that their evolution will be smooth. So in general, they're going to do something like this. And if I consider a slightly different loop, like just that loop there, very slightly different, um, there's also uh, nice theorems that tell me that uh, the these strands that are traced out are also not going to be very different. On the other hand, if I consider a very different control loop, like a loop that goes around this big blue loop here, well, again, I know the spectrum that I start with. I know that I have to end up with exactly the same spectrum. I know that every eigenvalue has to have smooth evolution in between, but because the eigenvalue spectrum is an unordered set, that smooth evolution doesn't have to connect each eigenvalue back to itself. 
The most general smooth evolution from a set of unordered n unordered points in the plane back to itself is what's called a braid. And I've illustrated one here. And so if I consider like some other very, very different loop, like this red one here, I could, again, same starting spectrum, same ending spectrum, smooth evolution in between, but that smooth evolution might be topologically distinct from the one generated by the blue curve, which is topologically distinct from the one generated by the green curve. Okay. So the first observation that I would make here is that a loop, every loop in control space, corresponds to a braid of eigenvalues. That's a general takeaway just from this kind of reasoning. But if I look at these braids, this one is like topologically different than this one, which is topologically different from this one. And it's a little curious then because these loops are not topologically distinct from each other. I can smoothly deform this red loop into this blue loop, nothing dramatic happens. Um, so what is it about a loop uh, in the control space that gives me a braid like this that distinguishes it from a loop like the green one that gives me a braid like that? Um, and to answer that, let me show you uh, by taking this red braid and just forcing it to smoothly turn into this blue braid. And to do that in this animation here, doing that cause, uh, requires me to force these two strands to pass through each other. That's the only way to turn one braid into the other. So let me show you, I can take it back. Here's the original red braid, and I'm gonna force it to be the same as this blue one, and that forced these two strands to pass through each other. Now, if I ask what that means, so the, cor the corresponding action in the space of control loops would be to take this red control loop and to smoothly deform it into the blue. That was what I just did over here. And you can see that what happened is that to take this loop, this braid topology and turn it into this one, I had to make two strands cross each other. And when two strands cross each other, that's the same thing as saying that two eigenvalues are equal at that one instant which means that in getting from this uh, red loop to this blue loop, there must have been a point when I hit a degeneracy, when I passed through a point that corresponded to a degenerate spectrum. So there must be a degeneracy there. Does this make sense? So uh, this is uh, hopefully uh, this makes sense, uh, but this can't quite be the entire answer because an isolated point in three dimensional or six dimensional space can't topologically distinguish one loop from another. Like if it was really just this point, I could smoothly deform this red curve into this blue curve without passing through there. Um, but that's okay because degeneracy is one complex constraint. It's the statement that one complex eigenvalue is equal to another. That's two real constraints which means that the condition of degeneracy corresponds to a subspace that has two dimensions less than the full space, corresponds to a subspace of co-dimension two, which means in this three-dimensional cartoon, just by this reasoning, degeneracies have to be a one-dimensional subspace. Okay? And a one-dimensional line of degeneracies for sure could make a topological distinction between loops, as I've drawn here in this cartoon. Okay. So this is most of the insight that I wanted to present. And now I'm just gonna sort of clean up this picture a little bit. So what I'd like to say is that every loop, not just in the control space, but now I should have been a little bit more precise. Every loop uh, that only specifies non-degenerate spectra makes a braid. So any loop that happens to pass through a degeneracy point would have two strands pinched together. That's not a braid, just as these things are defined. Okay, and uh, since I was saying that this red loop uh, gives me one topological braid and this blue loop gives me a, one, a different topological braid and this green loop gives me a different topological braid, that tells you that there must be a curve of degeneracies passing in the manner indicated to make these control loops topologically distinct, at least as regarded as loops within the purely non-degenerate subspace. Okay, so here is a, a more precise statement of that. Uh, which is that control loops that can be smoothly deformed into each other within the non-degenerate control space will generate the same eigenvalue braid. And equivalently, um, topologically equivalent uh, braids will correspond to topologically equivalent control loops. 
And I would say this more or less answers most of what I wanted to answer as far as the question of how do eigenvalues depend upon their matrix? This is the structure I'd like you to keep in mind. Um, and in doing so, uh, that's an answer to our question. Yeah, go ahead. It's very clear to cross them in degeneracy to be but how do I know that I cross? You know, oh, I don't undo the break. Good question. I can't answer your question. If I was a real mathematical physicist, I could answer your question. Um, but there may be an answer to your question implied in what I'm about to tell you which is that this is a pretty hand wavy. This is pretty qualitative reasoning. So I'm about to give you a, a little bit more sophisticated reasoning. And I'm going to do that by pointing out that what we've sort of talked about uh, in terms of this control space here is a catalog of which loops are topologically distinct from which other loops. Okay. So I've told you like this blue one is really different than this green one. Uh, and this blue one is very different from this uh, red one. And it turns out that if you're talking about a space that's maybe very big, very complicated, holy, or whatever, um, there are a lot of different ways of characterizing that space. But a very powerful tool for characterizing it is to define what is its fundamental group. And the fundamental group more or less amounts to providing a list of what are the topologically distinct kinds of loops that can live in that space. So I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, this notion of the fundamental group in a minute. But let me quickly summarize what we've learned here. The full control space of all polynomial coefficients is something I'll call L sub n for an n-dimensional system. And uh, as I argued a couple of slides ago, it definitely has this number of dimensions and is, has this structure. It's just Euclidean space. It's just all those uh, real numbers. And the topology of such a space is trivial as, uh, as I was, well, anyway. Uh, on the other hand, if, I have, uh, if I'm looking at just the part of that space that corresponds to non-degenerate spectra, well, that has dimensions, but I must get that space g sub n by removing from the original trivial space all the spectra, all the points that correspond to degenerate spectra. And the space that corresponds to degenerate spectra, as I said, is two dimensions less than the original space. But beyond that, I can't say very much. Like, I don't really know what that space looks like. I can't draw a picture of it for you. But I have learned one thing about this space of non-degenerate spectra, which is that every control loop in it corresponds to a braid. That's this correspondence between control loops in non-degenerate space and braids of eigenvalues. So now let me define for you a little bit, or at least illustrate for you, this notion of a fundamental group of a space. So let me take a three-dimensional space here. And uh, the fundamental group of a space is denoted as pi sub 1. And if I have three-dimensional space and I consider a whole bunch of loops that have the same starting and stopping point, I can smoothly deform any loop into, its, into any of the other ones. And I can deform them all, collapse them all smoothly back down to that point. So that means that the list of topologically equivalent classes of loops is just one. There's only one kind of loop. They're all the same. And so this is the trivial group. Um, I remember being really disturbed when I learned that the same statement holds for the surface of a sphere. So if I have the surface of a sphere and I have a, a point on it and I go around that sphere, I can smoothly deform that loop into smaller and smaller circles and in fact make it disappear. And if you ever meet someone who's just come back from a round the world trip and you want to be really pedantic, you can tell them there's no such thing. Okay. All closed loop journeys on the surface of the earth are topologically equivalent. You can't tell me I didn't just go around the earth because of the statement. OK, uh, so that's also a useful thing to learn in a colloquium. Um, so OK, what's that at space with non-trivial uh, fundamental group? Here's the plane minus a point. This is a plane in which I've poked a hole. And here, when I draw uh, loops for you, you notice that loops are topologically distinct um, as determined by the manner in which they enclose this hole. This is a concept you maybe bumped into called the winding number. Any loop that I draw in this space is characterized by a signed integer called the winding number that tells you basically how many times and in what sense did it wrap around this hole. So every loop in this space, no matter how crazy or complicated I draw it, uh, has associated with it an integer. Uh, 
Okay, so that's not trivial. Um, and you could think of, you could uh, extend this exercise to lots of familiar spaces like the surface of a torus, so on and so forth. Now the fundamental group uh, which characterizes spaces is a group. It's both this uh, catalog of kinds of loops and it's an operation. And the operation is to ask what happens when I take two loops and form a new loop that just consists of the concatenation of these two loops. So to explain to you what I mean, let me take this blue loop and this red loop and consider a new loop, which is just doing the blue one first and then continuing on to do the red one. And if I do that, you see that this purple loop, which makes a kind of crescent moon shape, doesn't enclose the hole at all. So it has a winding number of zero, and that's uh, a natural consequence maybe of the fact that I've concatenated a loop with winding number plus one and a loop with winding number minus one. So that's why this group is uh, the set of the integers with the operation of addition. Concatenating two loops gives you a new loop uh, that is just the integer that's the sum of the two loops you concatenated. So that's uh, pretty trivial as groups go. Uh, but there are more complicated situations. For example, on the surface of a torus, if I were to concatenate, uh, if I were to do this blue loop first and then this green loop, I could not smoothly deform that into the loop corresponding to doing the green loop first and then the blue loop, which is to say that you can have pretty straightforward spaces in which the concatenation of loops depends on the order in which they're concatenated. It's an operation that doesn't commute and so corresponds to a non-abelian group. You don't have to get to very exotic spaces to, to make that happen. Okay, so that's everything that I wanted to say about uh, the fundamental group as a way to characterize the topology of a space. And let's see how we can apply that uh, to the spaces of interest here. I think all I wanted to do is the following. So I told you that the full control space is just Euclidean uh, space. As I illustrated back down here a minute ago, that has the trivial group as its fundamental group, which is kind of what I've been meaning by saying topologically trivial. And I've told you that every loop in the space of non-degenerate spectra corresponds to a braid. And so the fundamental group of this non-degenerate control space is the braid group. So now we've learned something kind of quantitative about, uh, about these spaces, uh, but I still have a nice way of drawing a picture for you. This is a, certainly an interesting property. Uh, but I can't draw a picture for you. So to draw a picture, let me do the following. Um, and uh, let me remind you that what we're interested in is actually the characteristic polynomials of two by two or three by three matrices. And um, in the interest of time, let me sort of skip the exercise for two by two, which is just to write down what I know about the spaces already um, and skip uh, to the case of a three by three matrix. So I know that the full space of control parameters is four dimensions. There's the four real numbers I need to specify the appropriate characteristic polynomial. I know that there's gonna be some degenerate subspace of two dimensions, and I know that there's gonna be uh, the complement of that space. But to get a picture of what it really looks like, here's the actual characteristic polynomial of a traceless three by three matrix. It depends on two complex numbers, X and Y. I can form from that what's called the discriminant polynomial, which is the thing that vanishes only when this polynomial has degenerate roots. And so wherever this uh, vanishes, uh, I know I have some degeneracies. So here now is that space. So here's the four dimensional space. I've done my best to draw it. These are the real and imaginary parts of X and Y. There's definitely a threefold degeneracy when I set X and Y to zero at the origin of this space. Um, but there must be a bunch of other degeneracies around to make up the two-dimensional subspace that corresponds to the twofold, the double degeneracies, so the polynomials that have two degenerate roots. And it's a pretty straightforward exercise to find them. I just uh, write these two uh, complex coordinates in terms of polars. Um, I consider a sphere of fixed radius around the origin. And once I uh, work on just a sphere around this origin, that specifies the magnitudes of these two complex numbers. And for this equation to be satisfied, I basically have to have this uh, complex uh, phase factor, three times that equal two times this one, because I have a cubed here and a squared here. And that is exactly the parametric equation of a three, two torus knot, also known as a trefoil knot. That's just the parametric equation for this object here. So what that tells you is that in this space, if I go out and consider a a sphere of a certain distance, a three-dimensional sphere, a certain distance from this origin, I will find in that sphere a trefoil knot on which every point is a two-fold degeneracy. 
Um, and if I consider a slightly different sphere, none of this hinges on like the size of the sphere. So at smaller spheres, I'll find a smaller trefoil knot and a smaller sphere, I'll find a smaller trefoil knot. And when that sphere vanishes to zero, that's my threefold degeneracy. And so I can't draw it for you. I can't embed it in three dimensions, but the twofold degeneracies in the space consist of a trefoil knot that's sort of extruding out cone-like from the origin. And this has a name, this is called the topological cone of the trefoil knot. So that is my degenerate subspace, is this crazy cone of a trefoil knot. This is where your twofold degeneracies lie in the space of all third order polynomials. And the uh, control space that I'm interested in, everything except this uh, green trefoil knot is topologically non-trivial. It's four dimensional space with this crazy shape poked out of it. And so if I pick a point here and I draw some loop, um, loops are, and then some other one like this red loop, these loops are gonna be topologically distinct from each other depending on how they kind of pass through the coils of this trefoil knot. So this is the natural control space for three mode systems. Okay, um, and I think the takeaways are that uh, some things that we've already said here, but the point is that for any time you're talking about uh, matrices bigger than two by two, you're going to have a degenerate subspace that has some uh, interesting structure. And the non-degenerate subspace is going to be hard to describe, but is definitely Euclidean space from which uh, something non-trivial has been excised, such that the remaining space's fundamental group is the braid group. Okay. So that's uh, kind of the math I wanted to tell you about. And just the take home is that uh, if you're controlling uh, n by n matrices and wondering where the degeneracies are and wondering what eigenvalues do as you vary those matrices in a loop in the relevant space, this is what you're doing. Okay, um, so I should, uh, now I'll turn to the experiment and I'll say uh, we do experiments not to verify this. This is just math, like it doesn't need experimental verification. And uh, we're not doing it just because it's sort of cute and makes nice pictures. But because this is kind of an important result, coupled oscillators are like one of the most ubiquitous systems in all of physics. We build a lot of things out of them. And the fact that generically they have a, let's say underappreciated, uh, but very you know, powerful and elegant topological structure is, is surprising and interesting. And so it'd be worthwhile at least just go to see it once in real life. So to do that, we take a, a little one square millimeter sheet of silicon nitride and our three modes are just these additional modes of the membrane. These are the three things that we're gonna keep track of, the three eigenvalues, so to speak. And uh, they're governed as three oscillators are by a three by three matrix that we're gonna need to control. We're gonna need to explore this space. And it turns out that a really nice way to control uh, the dynamical matrix of a bunch of harmonic oscillators is to put those harmonic oscillators inside of an optical cavity and fill that cavity with light. And it just turns out that if you do that, uh, the intensity of the laser light and the extent to which that laser light is detuned from the cavity resonance give you knobs that appear inside this matrix. And for every extra laser beam that you send in there, you get some more knobs. So in practice, this involves a couple of different lasers. There are some tricks uh, to ensure that the, uh, in the end, we send in three laser beams. Um, our uh, control parameters are the powers of the three laser beams, the three powers, and then an overall detuning, a common detuning of all three laser beams. And it turns out that kind of when you grind through the math, those appear in this dynamical matrix in a way that spans uh, all those characteristic polynomial coefficients I was telling you about. The matrix looks like this. It gets very carefully placed inside of a high finesse optical cavity, which goes inside of a cryostat uh, and gets addressed by lots of lasers but that's the last time I'm gonna show you anything <laughs> that looks like that. So what we do is we have a system that looks like this and we're just gonna drive it as a function of frequency and measure its resonances. And if we do that, we sweep the frequency here, um, we get what looks like sort of a normal-ish peak, uh, but when we measure it, say this resonance or this resonance, it becomes more obvious that in fact, there are a bunch of modes that are hybridizing and mixing with each other. The hybridization and mixing is caused by the light that's sloshing back and forth inside this cavity via the radiation pressure. And at the end of the day, we just fit all of this data. That's the black line here. And fitting this response gives us the three 
normal modes eigenvalues, if you like, their resonance frequencies and line widths. And those are those three complex numbers that live somewhere in the complex plane. And when we change how we're filling the light, how we're filling the cavity with light, we would expect these resonances to move around and these complex eigenvalues to move around. Yeah. Um, each one is a Lorentzian. It's the contribute. So there are three modes. And when you when we measure, all we can measure is the total motion of the membrane. Uh, but when we do the fit and extract out where the resonances are, that fit tells us uh, the resonant frequency of each, uh, the, the resonance curve of each underlying mode. So these three are adding up to give the total. It doesn't look like they add up because they're actually complex numbers. And sometimes they're in, here's just their magnitude. They're sometimes in phase and sometimes out of phase. But uh, if you were to keep track of the full complex parts of these contributions, they would add up to the full. But yeah, so each little colored curve here is the contribution from one of these modes. All we measure is their total. So now what we're interested in is how will these eigenvalues move around as we vary uh, the dynamical matrix of the system by filling the cavity with light in different ways. And the first step uh, that we wanted to take is just to find the uh, threefold degeneracy. So I'll go through this very quickly, but basically we just scan around in this four dimensional parameter space and uh, record lots of eigenvalue spectra. Each pixel here is an eigenvalue spectrum. And then we ask, well, how close are the three eigenvalues to collapsing together? And the brighter is the closer the collapse is. And by scanning around in all the sort of sheets in this four dimensional space, uh, we can find a place where the three eigenvalues are really getting close to collapsing. And so this would be the threefold degeneracy at the origin of the, uh, at the origin of the space. But the most interesting thing that we're interested in is when you measure this eigenvalue spectrum on a surface that surrounds the threefold degeneracy, you should be left with a bunch of twofold degeneracies that uh, trace out a trefoil knot. And this is a little bit challenging because we're talking about a four dimensional space, a point that's surrounded by a three dimensional surface. It's a little hard to visualize, but there's a nice way of doing this. You just do what you do if you had a, a surface of a cube, you could unfold it uh, till it's flat six squares. And then remember that this yellow one is supposed to be connected with this blue one and the blue one with the purple. So you could smush them out like this. This last square has to get stretched out to infinity. This is basically a stereographic projection. But in this way, you could more or less convey the surface of a cube to your friends who live in Flatland. There's an analogy with a, a hypercube. It's made up of eight three-dimensional cubes, but they're connected in a way that's hard to represent here. You can represent that connection at the shape that looks like this. Um, and in practice, that's what we do. We, we raster three control knobs to trace out all the spectra in this cube, three other control knobs to trace out the spectra in this cube. Um, here are those cubes uh, just sort of represented visually. And then we keep in mind that uh, these cubes share certain common faces, which I've color coded here. So once we have all the data in all these cubes, we remember that they share certain common faces. We stitch those faces together. And then to preserve the topology, we smear them back out so that everybody who's supposed to be touching is touching. And the reason that this is nice is that all these axes end up corresponding to nice dimensionful coordinates that we actually vary, laser powers and detunings and the like. It's a little bit of a funny way to visualize, but it, it's a topology preserving way of visualizing the surface of a hypercube. Um, so in practice, what we do is we take that uh, hypercube surface, we uh, consider a bunch of 2D slices in it. We raster through the 2D slice. At every point, we measure a mechanical spectrum. We get out eigenvalues. We plot, in this case, they're discriminant, a quantity that's supposed to vanish and have a phase winding factor at any degeneracy point. Um, we identify those vanishings, those zeros, and the phase windings here using image recognition software. We do a little bit of filtering on the original data to make it a bit nicer. Um, and then we can compare it to a fit that I'll tell you about later to the, the, where this fit is done to the overall giant uh, data set. Um, each degeneracy that we get, we can uh, actually color by a certain property of the twofold degeneracy at that point. And then we just repeat that for lots of sheets all the way uh, through this uh, hypercube. And so here's the result of doing that. This is now the surface of a hypercube represented in this stereographic projection that I showed you before. 
And what I'm not showing you are 30,000 uh, spectra that were measured throughout here that didn't have any degeneracy in them. What I'm showing you is just 100 or 200 or so that did show twofold degeneracy. And what you can see is that uh, in this topology preserving representation of the surface of a hypercube, they trace out a trefoil knot. And you can also see it here in a slightly more conventional version of the stereographic projection. Um, the solid line here is a, uh, just the predictions of standard optomechanics theory uh, fits to the locations of all these observed twofold degeneracies. Okay, so that is the trefoil knot of twofold degeneracies in the space of uh, three mode spectra. The other thing that I wanted to tell you about is though, is what happens when I ask how the eigenvalue spectrum varies when I consider a loop in this space. So we're gonna do this just by taking that giant data set and plotting the eigenvalue spectrum as we in software imagine going around a loop like the one shown here. So, uh, and our data, this, course, this loop corresponded to about 20 different spectra, 20 spectra acquired on this loop. And if I trace out what those spectra do in the complex plane as I go around the loop, they make this sort of trivial braid that I showed you way back when. If I go into the uh, giant uh, collection of data and ask the software to trace out the eigenvalue spectrum on all the points that were measured around this loop, the recorded eigenvalue spectra uh, show the braid uh, indicated here. And if I consider a more complicated loop that encloses the trefoil knot differently, I get a more complicated braid. And between these three braids, the identity is really extraneous, between these two braids, you can concatenate them to form any braid in the braid group B3. So this is all the, uh, anything you can do with control loops in this space, you can do by concatenating these. This is the very last slide I'll show, and this is just quickly to illustrate uh, the non-abelian character of this group. So what I've done here is taken the same uh, data set, I've shown you where the degeneracies are, and I'm considering two loops here, a red one that goes like this and a blue one that goes like that. And here's what the eigenvalues do when I concatenate them by doing the blue loop first and then the red loop, I get this braid. But if I do the red loop first and then the blue loop, I get a completely different braid. Not even the permutation of the endpoints is the same which is to say that the space, that's three-dimensional space minus the trefoil knot has a non-abelian fundamental group, which is demonstrated here by the fact that these two operations don't commute. Okay, so that's everything uh, that I had to tell you. Um, basically, uh, my point is just that uh, there is uh, this kind of elegant structure that provides the natural description of what eigenvalues do when you vary the matrix that is giving you these eigenvalues. Um, and the precise statement would be that uh, every homotopy class of loops uh, in the space of non-degenerate spectrum corresponds to an isotopy class of eigenvalue braids, or more colloquially, a loop uh, determines a braid by the manner in which that loop encloses the degeneracies. Um, so that's, the, that's everything I wanted to tell you about. Um, in terms of looking ahead, uh, it would be reasonable to ask, well, what is this really useful for? Because one thing I can tell you is, like, this actually didn't have anything to do with this equation at all. This only had to do with what the eigenvalues do as you vary matrices. So it was really just a statement about matrices and their properties. And does it, so does it have any consequence for the actual time evolution, the dynamics governed by this equation? Um, and I would say probably, but I'm not sure. It's definitely generically true that eigenvalues and eigenvectors are kind of a scaffolding that tells you a lot about actual time evolution. Uh, but what we're really interested in is, you know, X as a function of time. So what, I, uh, what we are in the process of exploring is the following question. Is it possible to take this interesting braid structure and actually make it manifest in the real time evolution of a system governed by this equation? Uh, by, for example, initializing uh, taking a system that starts here with a spectrum like this and initializing it in a certain eigen mode. And then while that eigen mode is ringing in real time, vary the Hamiltonian either along this blue loop, which would cause eigenvalues to make this braid, or along this red loop, which would make eigenvalues form this braid. And if the adiabatic theorem were to apply, if we could just appeal to adiabaticity, I'd say, well, adiabatic evolution along the smoothly connected state for the blue loop would permute the excitation over to this mode, whereas for the red 
uh, case of the red loop, it wouldn't. And this would be very interesting to have this kind of robust topological control over these systems. It would be interesting also to ask if there's an analog to the barrier geometric phase that would be accumulated along such an operation. Um, but at this point, this is really an open question and something that we're just starting to explore. Um, so with that, uh, let me thank again uh, my colleagues, especially Yiming. Uh, are you here? Uh, okay, well, anyway, one of my undergraduates is visiting Stanford today as one of your prospective graduate students. Uh, let me thank Nick and his group and our funding sources, and thanks very much for your attention. Okay, uh, thank you. I'm actually not sure how to deal with uh, virtual questions, uh, but let's start with uh, the questions here, and we can move to the virtual ones. Yes. I'm trying to ask, was there a case where, or was there a possibility that you would need three times ten to the six spectra instead of thirty thousand in order to get this happen? Um, let me see if I understand your question. So, like, what's shown here are only the measurements that gave it degeneracy. And there's we have data on sort of 30,000 other data points. And we're piecing those together to make a loop like this. And it turned out uh, mercifully that with the data we collected, um, you know, when you stitch them together, it looks pretty reasonable. This coloring is actually not done by hand. A computer can tell that this braid is contiguous and this braid is contiguous. Um, and so it's kind of for our purposes, that's adequate to say, well, it looks like a braid. Um, I guess, could you have just taken 200 Yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah, like if, you, if we really knew everything and the system was perfectly stable, I'd say, look, I just don't even have to look. I'm just gonna collect spectra on this loop and plot it up and bang, I should get this. And on this loop, I should get that. Our system is pretty stable, but it's not like that stable. Oh, the, yeah, the solid yellow. Um, we sampled not exactly evenly in this space, but roughly evenly. Yeah. And, you know, we took, so I would say that 30,000 spectra took about 100 days of data acquisition. And so after the first 10 days, we definitely looked and checked and, oh, no, actually, such and such a parameter that we thought was this is off by a few percent and we should be more over here. We did a certain amount of that, but there's roughly evenly spread data throughout there. So if you want to see, uh, here they are uh, rotating. Um, yeah. So, yeah. so would one consequence of this maybe uh, be this kind of gives a limit on the adiabatic theorem? Like you can change your parameters um, and that theorem still applies, but you better not pick one of these degeneracies or. Um, yes, that's sort of true, even in Hermitian systems, like the concept of adiabatic transport definitely hinges on your spectrum not becoming degenerate. But I was so nervous about going a little bit too long that I forgot to say something very important, which is the adiabatic theorem does not apply if your matrix is non-Hermitian. So in fact, there's no, I have no basis for drawing you this silly cartoon in which there's smooth evolution along the braid, braid strands. That's more or less guaranteed not to happen. Uh, but, you know, adiabatic control is not like the most sophisticated thing you could come up with if you want to uh, accomplish something. There are a lot of ways of taking what would not be an entirely successful adiabatic operation and making it still do this. There's a, a, a substantial field known as shortcuts to adiabaticity where you uh, accomplish more or less adiabatic uh, evolution, um, but you go faster than the adiabatic theorem would ever allow you to by doing some little bit of extra control bits. So what we're really interested in is learning how to apply notions of shortcuts to adiabaticity to make this actually happen. Uh, so at some point, when we form these non-trivial topological structures, uh, do we break time versus symmetry? And is there, there's some connection between that and the non commission terms? Yeah, as soon as you introduce, so uh, if I go way back, um, if I'm talking about coupled oscillator systems and I am preserving uh, time reversal symmetry and reciprocity symmetry, then my dynamical matrix will definitely be Hermitian 
uh, I will have built my system exclusively out of masses and springs, right? So if I just have these objects, my time evolution will be Hermitian and eigenvalue, eigen, the eigenvalue evolution of a Hermitian matrix will not break. It's just like conceptually impossible for a bunch of numbers on the real line to break. There's, there's no room for them to do that. Um, so there is this topology definitely is associated with uh, breaking time reversal, yes, but to have a to have this kind of full power of uh, arbitrary complex matrices and the nice mathematical results uh, that are known about like uh, arbitrary complex polynomials and their roots, which is kind of what I was appealing to, um, the most natural thing would be to include all the linear elements that are provided to us, uh, which is uh, both time reversal symmetry breaking, loss and gain, but also non-reciprocity. Before you form like a, a topological structure, though, does that mean preserve? Um, can you say that again? Uh, yeah, so I'm wondering if, uh, like, at the point where we make a grade or something, for example, some topological structure, if, like, that's the point at which we no longer have time to. No, I would say as soon as you're talking about an eigenvalue spectrum that consists of a bunch of points in the complex plane. You're talking about a system that doesn't have time reversal symmetry. A system that did, they would all lie on the real axis. Okay, well, we have no other questions. Let's thank you. Yeah, thank you very much.